From beautiful downtown Guthrie, welcome to Hit the Bricks. Everything that's interesting about Guthrie, Oklahoma. It is hot. It's so hot. Hot, so hot, hot, hot. We're here in Lisa Sorrell's boot making shop. Where it's nice and cool in here. Yeah. It's hot outside. Yeah, so not only thank you for being with us today, letting us be with you, but thank you for having an air-conditioned building. Yes. Yeah. It's for my own benefit as well. Yes, because oh, this good. was my first time to come in here, and I said, we're going to be at Lisa's place. I was thinking, downtown building, this can go either way. Of course, we were in city council last night in the third floor air conditioning, except for Justin's office, is, is out. It's amazing how that works. The, the entire floor is out except for Justin's office. That's but actually not true. <laughs> Mine's the worst. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was told wrong. No, it's hotter in my office than anywhere else. Okay, yeah. so the entire third floor is out. Correct. Oh, right. so, you know, I was saying, man, it's going to be hot in the downtown building, but nice and cool in here. Well, actually, this building is not so historic. This building was built in 1967. Oh, it's oh. a baby of a building. Yeah. <laughs> Practically brand new. Yeah, the one next door was built in 1899, but this is a newer building. Which, this is the 200 block, 217 mm -hmm. East Oklahoma, so I did not know that, 1967. I think, according to what I've read, it was originally just a vacant lot, and for back in the... the um, Historic times, it was there was a bar that was just a tent or something. It was never a permanent building. You know, uh, interesting how that is because you know the the two downtown buildings. If they, you know, hopefully they're going to be able to fix them up, restore them. But I was thinking, if you always had, if you had to rebuild a brand new building in downtown Guthrie, if it's even possible, or how long you would have to find the brick mm -hmm. and all that, how that process would be to build a building in 2019 and try to get it to where it was in 1889, 19, yeah, whatever. Probably cost like billions yes. of dollars. Yeah, uh, I've seen pictures of <laughs> sound <laughs> effects guy back. <laughs> if you're just listening, my chair does is like an uh, uh, unexpected recliner. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, I've seen what were we talking about? Oh, buildings, buildings. <laughs> um, so like I've seen pictures of new construction where they've done like like pretty amazing jobs of making it look like something that was built a hundred years ago. Yeah. But you can still like. I guess it's just like the the weathering of buildings probably makes it kind of impossible to to really replicate those things. And you know, the Carnegie Library went through a lot of renovations uh, mm. within the last several months. And if I didn't drive my kid to school every day, I probably wouldn't have known that it was reverberated because mm -hmm. they made it look like it was when it was originally built. But you can tell it's updated with stuff. But you wouldn't know. I wouldn't have known unless yeah. just because I saw it. Sure. Well, if you take a good look at this building, you'll realize it was not built. In. And I will do that because I... <laughs> Any time that was interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so when when did you uh, locate yourself in this building? I believe I bought this building in 2000, if I remember correctly. And it had been a restaurant. And when the last restaurant owners left, they just closed the door and walked out. There were walk-in freezers right here, and they closed the doors to two walk-in freezers and left. And I bought the building six months later, and it was disgusting. Yeah, I bet so. It had just been, um, the roof had leaked for years. Uh, there was an ice machine over here, and it had leaked. I actually had mushrooms growing on the floor here. We ripped this down to studs and completely remodeled this building. That sounds super exciting. Greasy stove? Yeah, I can, that's the first thing that popped to my Yes, mind. Yeah. and yeah, yeah, right here was was a huge stove that had a, a hood above yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And so I was tired from days of remodeling, and I was sitting up front. And my husband and a friend were looking at that hood, and it had an exhaust you know, spray system on it. Uh -huh. And I remember hearing them say, I think we can disable that. And all of a sudden I heard, pop! And I looked, and there was just cloud of white rolling towards the front. And I ran out the front door, and this cloud just rolled out the front door because they had, they had popped the fire suppression system. <laughs> That's pretty exciting. So you can still you'll see layers of white dust on stuff. Wow. When it was a when it was a restaurant, I hadn't actually moved to Guthrie yet, but I was I was here one day. My parents were already living here, and I'd stopped into Guthrie, and I wanted to eat. It was either lunch or dinner. So I stopped into this building to eat. Mm -hmm. I think it was a barbecue place. Chips. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was the only person in here. And the OU Nebraska game was on TV. It was back the, uh, the year that um, OU beat Nebraska. 31-17 yeah. pepper spray game. And people were losing their minds over it. And Red I October. 
I didn't know anything about anything uh-huh. about OU sports because I wasn't um, married to Amanda yet, so I didn't care. <laughs> but I was sitting there like watching that game like right out there. I was like, ah, oh, that's probably a good thing for OU to be doing well today. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so that was that was my experience uh, eating. So you've here. been in my building. Yeah. Yeah. I had forgotten about that until just this very second. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that my boot shop is in the kitchen area and in the front area is where the tables and chairs were. And then there's a conference room in the back. I got to tell you, there's a lot more stuff in here than I would ever imagined. Well, what a lot of people don't know is originally I was a cowboy boot maker. I've done that for 29 years. I like to tell people I started when I was four. Yeah. <laughs> Same time as Justin was born. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And, um, but about seven or eight years ago, I started another business. I sell leather tools and supplies to other boot and shoe makers, uh, okay. uh, literally across the world. And I do a lot of importing from, from Europe and Mexico. And that business has taken over my life and it's now my primary business. So when you walk in the front door, you're seeing my inventory that goes out in boxes every day. Makes a lot of sense. It's funny how you get into one thing. Like I used to cover sports. Mm -hmm. That's all I did and went into the deep side and did new stuff. It it just consumes you like, I'm going to do this forever and then I'll try this for a little bit. Yes. I mean, it's just like that. Yes, this business has exploded, and I love it because it's another way for me to stay in the industry and contribute to the industry in a very real and meaningful way, but at the same time, it's a little easier on my aging hands. It's a little different, too. My 33-year-old hands. (laughs) Was it an incremental change where you kind of woke up one day like, hey, I've been selling some things. Why don't I just do this more? Well, what happened was, uh, let's see kind of a combination of two things. I started a YouTube series because I kind of looked around YouTube and realized, oh, if you're a photographer, there's a million others on YouTube. It's going to be hard to stand out. But hey, if you're a bootmaker, you can be famous. Yes. And um, so I started a YouTube show and I use a special kind of knife. And people started asking me, where do you get that knife? And there wasn't really any source I could send them to. So I started having them made in Japan and selling them. And then also around the same time, I was realizing that I needed to phase out using solvent-based cements. It was affecting my health, and they're not good for you. The fumes go straight to your liver. So I was in Germany, and I found a company that was selling water-based glues, and they gave me samples. I came back, and I used them, and went, these are great. They really perform well. So I contacted the company and said, where can I get them? And they said, we don't have a U.S. source. And I said, <laughs> hey, can I, I do that? <laughs> and that's how I became a rep for this company. And then it just began. You're like, I am YouTube famous, yes. so let's just do this. Yeah. yeah, it kind of snowballed from there. And, you know, I used to be super excited if I got two orders a week. And now, well, I stopped even going to the post office. I do pickup orders every mm, day now. And that has wow. changed my life again. So you don't have to walk the, the two blocks to the post office anymore? Once in a while, you'll see me trotting up there because yeah. someone has a rush order. But as a rule, I just let the, the mail person pick it up. Right on. So people don't necessarily come, like, walk into the, your shop here to buy things. It's all like order online kind of? Yes, uh, yes. It's I have a website and people order online. Once in a while, I will get someone email me and say, I'm coming through Guthrie. Can I stop and come to your store? And of course they can, but I encourage... I encourage appointments. I'm the only person here, and I don't want to miss someone who's driven across country just because I'm at lunch. Oh, sure. That makes sense. So how did boot business come? I mean, how did you come, the boot lady? I mean, how did this all come about? It's just something. The boot lady. That's, yes. that's <laughs> yeah. I'm well, real simple. <laughs> I'll go, back, go back just a little bit farther than, than you might anticipate. Uh, when I was, I was raised in a very conservative little church where the ladies all wear long hair and long dresses, okay. similar to Mennonite. And when I was 12, my mom began teaching me to sew. And by the time I was 14, she was coming to me for sewing help. And at 15, I began sewing clothing professionally for the ladies in my church. That just made sense to me, I think, in patterns. Yeah. You know, I can just look at you and I know how every part of your T-shirt would be shaped if we cut it apart. Because my, my brain just works that way. So anyway, when I was 20, my husband and I left Missouri, where my business was, and we got married and moved to Oklahoma. And after six months in a three-room apartment with no business, I got bored, and I answered an ad in the paper for stitching boot tops. I had no idea what that meant, but I could sew. And the old guy that answered the phone was very gruff, and he said, sewing leather is nothing like sewing clothing. And he was right, but he (laughs) hired me anyway, Uh and that's how I got started. Was that here in Guthrie? That was here in Guthrie, uh, right up on 2nd Street. His name was Jay Griffith, and 
for the people who was who were in town during Jay Griffith's reign, uh, they would remember him. He was quite yeah. a character. So an ad in the paper is what got you to Guthrie. Yes, and I actually several years ago I went through the uh, microfiche or whatever it's called up at the the um, library mm -hmm. and tracked down that copy of the newspaper and found the ad. Mm. And so now I have a copy of that ad. That's cool. That's that is cool. cool. Microfish. I haven't thought about microfish in a long time. Yeah. yeah. I've never done that, but I was scrolling through and I found mm. it. My son has no idea what that is. No. That would be. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, I can't remember. We were talking to somebody on this show one time. They were talking about, you know, the, the going through newspaper, going through the old archives and how that, that would be cool to kind of see some of this stuff. Newspaper.com. I can't remember what website it was he, that he, but it's kind of like the micro type mm -hmm. deal. Yeah. So. I remember um, uh, hearing uh, somebody with uh, that was involved in like a, a, a documentary and the, his, his whole entire job was just to go through archival footage of, of stuff. And, you know, they have, a movie has a thousand different people who are working on a thousand different things, but his sole job was just to sit there for, you know, 15 hours a day just look, like looking at old archival footage of things, just trying, trying to find little snippets. Like, oh, that'll work for something. That'll work for something. Uh, go cross-eyed after a while. Yeah, yes. no kidding. So, so you're stitching, you get here, you get the beautiful gut through, you're stitching a boot and you're like, well, this design is not very good. I can do better than this. No, it didn't. No. Really, didn't really work that way. Jay was <laughs> <Straight> such, <to laughs> <the theater. laughs> Jay was such a talented designer. Um, uh, often people say to me, "Well, you're good with color and design because you're a woman." And I always say to them, "Everything I learned about color and design, I learned from a grumpy old alcoholic." Okay. Because. <laughs> That's a, that's a t-shirt. <laughs> he had he had such a delicate touch with color and design, and he would always say, a cowboy boot should look like a Coke bottle or a beautiful woman, and he would make an hourglass motion, and he would tell me that, that the lines on a cowboy boot need to be sensuous and graceful, and so I learned from him, and it took me years and years to have the confidence to try designing my own because everything... All of the designs I got for him from him were so perfect mm -hmm. that it took me a long time to decide that maybe I could do something at least approaching Close. it. Yeah. So the, on the we started talking about this before we started recording, but um, on the creative side of it, there's a, the technical aspect of like working machines, learning machines, learning the craft of it. There's also the design side. Like you know, your boots have all kinds of like the way that different elements work together. Mm -hmm. Like the, the the artistic side of it, what was harder to develop? That the artistic, like creating like the design, that the, the shapes and forms of different things, or the technical aspect of the boot making. I can't say that that one is harder than the other. I think of cowboy boots as a really perfect marriage between art and craft, because it has to be beautiful, but it also has to fit. And, and those things are, are so, that's a delicate balance there. I'll tell you the thing that appealed to me first and most about cowboy boot making was the craft aspect. You got to hammer things. You got to use really big machines that sounded mm. loud. And I love that. There are some monster machines yes. in here. Yeah, I've got like, some massive machines. You're not messing around with like <laughs> little piddly stuff. No, <laughs> because the way I was raised, uh, girls did girl things and boys did boy things. And so... While I do love the artistic atmosphere and um, aspect of cowboy boots and the color and the design and all that, that's a girl thing. So the fact that I also <laughs> got to do boy things and yes. hammer and use these massive machines, that made me incredibly happy. And, and I enjoyed both aspects You of could it. take an arm off with some of this stuff in here. It's pretty exciting. Well, actually, one of the... Things that bootmakers love to do when they get together is compare scars. You know, sort of like <laughs> Rene Rousseau and um, Mel Gibson in uh -huh. *Lethal Weapon 3*, where they're like, "See my oh, scars." Yes. Okay, that's what bootmakers do. Ah. And um, I have one friend who actually sewed himself. He sewed over his finger one of those machines, and they have humongous needles. And he sewed <laughs> over his finger, and he was out of reach off the phone, so he couldn't call for help. And he ended up having to back the machine out of his finger. He wins. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have, knock on wood, I have not done that yet. I love that I made like a, a small joke about like cutting your arm off and your like, your eyes lit up like, yep. <laughs> it I can happen. Yeah. It can happen. No, there's a Dick Francis there's a Dick Francis book where um, the hero of the book is a toy maker and so he has this little factory where he makes all these really cool toys and at the end the bad guy attacks him in the factory and he ends up 
you know, using all of these tools that are around to defend himself. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought that could happen here. I've got access to lots and lots of you frightful should, things. <laughs> you keep your cell phone with you because I don't see a lot of phones on the wall that you get all the machines. <laughs> but I do have knives. Yes. <laughs> I remember in, uh, one summer in college, I got a job working for a guy who was b building houses. And uh, he just had me and a couple other people uh, staining cabinets and just whatever random stuff that he needed to do on these places. And he always made jokes about how he would hire uh, like woodworkers and crafts people that and he would like his one of his requirements was they had to be they had to be missing at least one finger <laughs> just because he figured that but if you if you've lost a finger you've probably learned your lesson with different like safety aspects of stuff and, i would yeah. i would prefer older people who haven't lost yeah. fingers yeah, okay cool. <laughs> to me that shows they knew what they were doing in the first place <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. Maybe so. so the i'm sure all all boots are different but what's the What's the probably the longest step? I kind of go through the steps, but what's the longest step? The design phase, the building? You know, actually, in, in Europe, shoemaking is divided into three parts. Okay. There's the clicker and the closer, and sometimes those are different people and sometimes they're the same. But the clicker and the closer, they cut out the leather and they sew it together. Okay. And, um, oh, and before that, you have the last maker. So first you have the last maker, and they measure the feet and create the custom form for the footwear. Then you have the clicker and the closer, and then you have the maker who takes that yeah. upper and that last and creates the boot or shoe. So in America, we don't have that system, so I have to be everything. And Which is good and bad. Yes. It's, it's bad because if it takes you 20 years of experience, and it does, to mm -hmm. be a good clicker or closer, then now I've got 60 years ahead of me because right. I need to do all three of them. And all of them are equally challenging. I would say last making is the most challenging because fit is something I can measure your foot and I can make something that, in my opinion, fits you perfectly. Mm -hmm. But old boot makers say you don't fit their foot, you fit their head. Because if you don't think it think fits, it doesn't fit. fit. So that's the challenge of that. That's um, some Mr. Miyagi kind of speaking of. Yeah. Yes. Sweet delay. Karate Kid t shirt on. But yeah, that's, there's, that's a, a philosophical thing. Oh. I think clicking and closing is actually the easiest. That's that's what I'm known for is the upper designs. And that's something you can learn. I, you might have to work on the artistic ability, but as far as just sewing a seam, you can learn that. And then making, even if you have a perfect last, there are things you can do in putting the boot together that destroys the fit. Well, and the good thing about it is you're do, you're experienced and know what you're doing, so you, you're you go through the entire process mm -hmm. and you it's your print on the entire process. Yeah, there's there's two schools of thought there because like in a small boot factory you have multiple people. And the benefit of that is speed. They can yep. do it faster. And also the benefit of that is the guy that's stitching your boot tops has so much experience on that machine. He can do it better than anyone you've ever seen. But the bad side is there's the potential for a breakdown in communications because the guy that measures your feet is not the guy that does your boot tops, yeah. is not the guy that chooses your toe and heel, and so things can break down. On the other hand, with someone like me, since it's only me, I charge far more because I'm the one that put in all Absolutely. of these years of experience, and also I'm slower. Yeah. What's experience more, goes a long way. What's more satisfying when, like, when you... When you give the, a pair of new boots to the customer, like, are you more satisfied with if they say this is the best fitting boot I've ever like felt, or this is the the, the most beautiful boot? What's more, is it design or the fit that fit. makes you fit fit all the, the way? Because I <laughs> because I know I can make something beautiful. Oh, okay, I have enough cool. experience to be absolutely confident yeah. I can make you something beautiful, but fit every time is a worry. Huh. Interesting. Because again, it's not only my opinion; it's yours. Sure, like the um, the fact that there's so much detail that goes into the fit of your boots kind of melts my brain. Just because, like the hiking boots I have on, which are like in the hiking boot world, these are nice boots. Yeah. But nobody have, nobody measured my toe. <laughs> you to, have narrow feet, don't you? I do. Yeah. And um, like, but yeah, there was no like, craftsperson mm -hmm. who like shaped these uh, you know nice hiking boots to my feet. But these are still like my brain says, hey, I just paid a good chunk of money for these. But like your your world is like so much more involved 
than like me hanging out at the the outdoor shoe, you know sports shoe place and getting a pair of boots. She looked at your foot for a second and it was narrow just like that. Right. Yeah. It's the way it's your like laces she's a are done. <laughs> Mike, can you tell why narrow? Mm, why your shoes aren't aren't showing as much? Oh. Narrow, wide, weird. <laughs> <laughs> You know, people used to um, be more more knowledgeable about how shoes and boots were made and the process that went into it and also have more options for fit. And now, you know, you were asking about me about your foot and showing me your shoes. Um, a lot of shoes nowadays are basically shoe boxes with a pillow in them. Yes. It's not that those fit or don't fit. They're soft. Soft. And mm -hmm. that's what covers up any aspect of fit. And unfortunately, we've moved so far that now you can get that for $40. Uh, yeah. And then you can come to me and get a pair of custom-made boots for 15000 Right. And, and it's such a humongous gap that um, we've just lost a whole whole section of knowledge no one understands why that gap exists or or what should happen in the middle and it's it's just a shame that it's it's gone that way because i can't do it cheaper but the average person isn't going to spend fifteen thousand dollars for a pair of boots right. and um and your factories can just spit them out and and there's nothing in the middle that's a decent fit and well made and yeah because it's amazing because i when, you, when you're saying that I was kind of going through how many shoes, and I, I'm not a big shoe guy, I, I just, you know, I, but I go through three, four pair a year, it seems mm -hmm. like, just because they break down, too. Mm -hmm. So that kind of makes sense. Of, they put more out there. And They're it's made out of foam and plastic. Foam and plastic, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's all about the, when you walk in, have the cushing, and, mm -hmm. and, but they break down quick, too. And if you, if you look at boot and shoe prices uh, 150 years ago, people tended to have one or two pairs of shoes because it was a significant portion of their income to buy a pair of yeah. shoes. And now you expect to go to Walmart and buy a pair of flip-flops for $2 and call that shoes. Mm -hmm. And so you would never consider spending a whole month of your income on a pair of shoes. Yeah. For the boots that you sell folks, um, like if they, if it is going to be like an, an, something they wear every day, or you know, at least most of the time, is that like it, how long do these those boots last for that person? It depends on how well they take care of them. If you wear your boots through mud puddles and then send them by your wood stove, then not very long. Hmm. And and also, I do have to admit, what I make is totally a luxury product. No one has to have fifteen thousand dollar pair of boots. Right. Um, I have a lot of bootmaker friends who make working gear, and um, in that price range, you're looking at two to four thousand mm dollars -hmm. but that's what you should be paying for the type of footwear that we're making and the attention to detail and the fit that you're getting so that that's actually good value for your money it's just the market has changed so much that yep. no one understands that more people interested in custom specialized boots or is it just kind of it, it depends on what they do yeah. you've got the people the there's still some working cowboys and so they want working cowboy gear yeah and so you've got that segment of the market and then you have people with problem feet to where they don't have an option of buying footwear at the store. And then you just have people who have more money than they know what to do with right. and they want to do something with it that they can brag about. Right. And that's my portion yes. of the market. <laughs> so cowboy boots, um, you know, it's, the cowboy boots are kind of associated with like, you know, uh, Western, uh, you know, Americana kind of things, but uh, like, what is a di what's the difference between a cowboy boot and a boot from you know like any other boot? What makes a cowboy boot a cowboy boot? Part of it is the construction, but most of it, the cowboys, cowboy boot developed as a thing, a specific thing, by the design on the boot tops, and that was all about that was all about pretty. Um, cowboy boot, cowboys are very vain. They like bright colors. <laughs> yes. And, and so that would, the function of the cowboy boot tops is there isn't one. It's, you know, the height maybe, but as far as an argument for the color and the design, 
that's about being pretty. Uh, you can make an argument for the, the pointy toe and the high heel. Again, some people will say, oh, the pointy toe is so you can find your stirrup. Not so much because you can find your stirrup without a pointy toe. Uh, the high heel, so your, your foot won't slide through and get caught. Again, not so much. Uh, high heels and pointy toes were, if you wear high heels, it makes your legs look longer and your butt right. looks smaller. Right. And cowboys were very vain. So <laughs> cowboy boots aren't working gear, but they're also so much about vanity. That's awesome. <laughs> the, 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 pointy, the pointy one, they just... And I, I, I have one pair of boots and... My so-called friend calls them plastic boots, but they're not plastic, I don't think. But they just the pointy ones, they just look like they they hurt. Well, if they're custom made, they don't. Because mm -hmm. if, if well, you right, right, yeah. if you hired me to make you a pointy pair of boots, then I would take into account the shape of your toes. Yeah. So you would get both accommodations for your toes okay. and a pointy toe. Gotcha. It just looks it's just like when I see these women in high heels, I'm like, how do you how do you do that? It's just not comfortable. I don't know, A, how you walk, and then it looks crammed in there. Well, often it is because yeah. they're, they're not made well. Yeah. Um, there's, this is a little technical, but there's something called a combination last. So m many people have a narrow heel and a wider forepart. Mm -hmm. And so with a combination last, instead of being a B width, it's like a A width in the heel and a C width in the, in the front. And that works for so many people, and no one uses that. Yeah. You mentioned earlier uh, people have more money than what they know with new with, which is part of your line. What are some of those? Has there been any odd requests that you're like, yeah, I can, I can't do that. That's weird, but okay. I'll tell you the most fun thing that I've done recently, and and I love it when someone brings me. For one thing, when I do a cowboy boot, I'm very interested in doing something that works for cowboy boots. Like, when I was first starting out, I did a pair of cowboy boots with a coral reef design on it. Okay, it looked technically fantastic, but a coral reef design doesn't belong on a pair of cowboy boots. Right, right, right. So that made it wrong. Yeah. Okay, so this one is kind of skirting that line, but it worked so well. Oh, my goodness. Um, so I met some guys. They're called the Malpas Brothers, and they do... Not the Mathis Brothers. No, Malpas. Malpas. M-A-L-P-A-S-S, -S, Malpas okay. Brothers, and they do classic country music. They're young guys. They have big hair, and they're so fun. Anyway, um, I s got to make them boots, and I was talking to Taylor Malpas, and I said, what do you want on your cowboy boot tops? And he said, I love the Leuven Brothers. The Leuven Brothers were a band from late 40s to the 60s, and they did wonderful country music. And their, Satan is Real. Yes, their yeah. most iconic album yeah. is Satan is Real. And Ira Leuven, <laughs> Ira Leuven, well, this is the legend. Out of plywood, Ira created a uh, plywood Satan, painted it red. Satan, in case you didn't know, has protruding front teeth and really small hands and weird hair. But anyway, Duh. he did. He did. Yeah, yeah, he did plywood Satan, and they went to uh, a, a rock. Good band name, plywood Satan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I long to own plywood Satan, but I think he's gone. Anyway, they went to a rock pit, and and they did this photo shoot with plywood Satan, and the the. The album is called Satan is Real. So Taylor Malpas said to me, he said, I want a pair of Satan is Real boots. So I got to put Satan and the flames and everything and the Satan is Real um, on a pair of cowboy boots. And that was truly a lifelong dream. But when he asked me, <laughs> when he told me this is what I want, my first reaction was, is that possible? Can I do it? And, and I could and I did. Yeah. So, yeah, sometimes people almost stump me. But so far, I haven't been completely stumped uh, you were showing me earlier a, a new design you're working so you you have to like you sketch things out first and then it's a matter of taking like the sketch that you've drawn and then taking that to the different pieces of leather and uh, is there a point where you're sketching things or you say okay um, here I'm, I've approached the limit of what I can get from sketching versus putting leather together no, it's really the other way. Um, sketching for leather inlay and overlay, which is what I do. Um, so leather inlay would be if you cut a flower-shaped hole and put a different colored leather behind. Mm -hmm. And leather overlay would be you cut a flower shape and lay it on top. Okay. And, and I work 
with both of those. So there's a very specific way of drawing to, to where you know it's going to be possible in leather inlay and overlay. And, and so that's what limits me. When I draw something, then I know, whoops, I just drew something that looks good, but I can't do this in leather inlay and overlay. So you don't have to have that necessarily like an, an argument with yourself. Every, like, mm -hmm. like your brain wants to draw something. The other part of your brain is like, nope. No, no, actually, I'm not a very good artist. You know, if you tell me to give me a piece of paper and say draw a bird, I could never do it. But the only way I'm able to draw is in the form of leather inlay and overlay. So I can draw a bird that can be inlaid, but I can't draw a real bird because I've just been doing this for so long. That's how uh, my brain works. See, I'm a hor horrible artist as well. The birds just draw like an M. It looks like a bird. Yeah. Um, but uh, technology, when you started 29 years ago, has technology improved the boot or is the old school way like, maybe like the design has the computer help with designs or is it still the way to do it 29 years still the better way with technology building the boots hasn't changed at all okay. i'm still using historic methods and nothing about that has changed uh the computer has helped me a lot with design i yeah. will show my age here because i remember when i first started for instance if i needed to do a boot top with a buffalo on it i remember going to the library and looking in an encyclopedia for a picture yeah. of a buffalo Botanica. Yes, uh -huh. <laughs> and so now I can just get online, and, and I can also, yeah. if once I get a picture, it's easy to take it into Photoshop and reduce it to the size I need or whatever, well, so if, that's helped tremendously. When, when you're talking to somebody in Idaho, it can be through email and pictures instead of yes. one visiting or Yes, I often or work pictures. back and forth with people yeah. by email, too. So the, the work that you do then... Like it probably, it, it may not have been possible 20 years ago with the way that the internet and technology supports how like your business model these days. So like this, this method of this old school, like really artisanal method of making boots, uh, the internet in a way, is it making that possible for people to, to do more of that now? It's definitely changed the industry. I remember Jay telling me, let's see, Jay was born in 1913, I believe. And um, I remember Jay telling me that he lived on a farm out on a ranch in Texas and he wanted, decided he wanted to grow up and be a bootmaker. And so there was an old bootmaker in town that also made violins. So he would hike into town so he could watch this little guy and learn. And um, if he walked in the door and the guy was working on boots, he would just lay them down and go work on violins. And the reason for that is, a hundred years ago, if you moved into my town as a bootmaker, you threatened my livelihood. Absolutely. Whereas today, there are far more customers than there are makers. And uh, there's another bootmaker in Guthrie, Ray Doorwork. It's great having him here. If I run out of rubber heel caps, I can call Ray. If he needs nails, he can call me. We are not in any way competition. And that's how the world has changed. And so the internet just helps us get the word out. But bottom line is, if you want to order boots, at some point you have to come to Guthrie and sit down and let me measure yep. your feet. So that part hasn't changed. So from the point when someone, you know, drives or flies or whatever to get to your shop to have uh, their foot measured, uh, how long do I got to wait to get a pair of boots? Usually What's around... What's your name? <laughs> <laughs> how much money do you have? Yeah. Usually around a year and a half. That's amazing. I'm not accepting very many boot orders now at all because of the supply business. Um, it has always been my dream and my goal to only make boots that I want to make for the people I want to make them for. And, and get to see cowboy boots are commissioned work. I don't get to make anything till you come in and tell me what you want and I never get to make what I want. And I'm moving more into that yeah. and, and finding joy in that and, uh, it feels it feels powerful and and I like it. Who's buying stuff from you, like the the, the supplies? Who are you seeing that are like? Uh, are there more people like getting into this trade, or who are you seeing that is that is either learning to do this or doing it? That's out there buying things from you. The shoe hobby market is really hot right now. For instance, one of the things that I bring in um, from Europe is: Do you remember in the '70s those wood sandal bases? The, the wood wedges. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, I, yeah. I bring in those wooden and sandal bases, and then you can buy those in your size, and you can buy some straps, and you can tack them on, and you just made yourself a pair of sandals. 
Old and, school. All right. Yeah. And you, so, so you, can hear, you can hear you coming. Clop, 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 <laughs> yes. clop. clop. Yeah. So that's a hobby market. And then I also have real boot and shoe makers who are buying those and doing really fancy work on the straps and then building a business by selling those sandals. So it's everything from somebody who decides, hey, I think I can make shoes to small factories who need supplies. Uh, your skills at building or making cowboy boots, I, the uh, the techniques involved in that, is it kind of like a, a cross-cutting thing where you could venture over into making a different type of shoe and you would know what you were doing? Or is it, or is each type of shoe or boot, um, like the genre of boots, is it unique enough to where like, you're kind of like, that's your gig, you don't mess with Spanish yeah. um, conquistador boots. <laughs> right. That, um, it's an up. excellent question. Well, um, thanks. <laughs> you probably got because, one. Yes. <laughs> yes. If you're well, making you a graphic in front of that. Excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> so finally, finally, finally. <laughs> if you're making what I so um, 19 episodes superciliously refer to as real footwear, you know, as opposed to sandals. Um, that you just glue together. Again, I'm trying not to be too supercilious, but real footwear that's that's welted and made of leather. So yes, um, for instance, I'm I'm now exploring making men's dress shoes, and so I have some really foundational skills that that make that easy for me. But at the same time, there are things about men's dress shoes that are totally different than cowboy boots, and I don't know those things. So um, I sometimes make things that look like men's dress shoes because I'm reverting back to oh. to my old habits so yes the foundational skills i have are there but that doesn't mean that there are still things i need to learn to become a shoemaker or a riding boot maker or whatever i've always uh been a fan of uh doctor who i don't know if you've ever watched doctor who before who? doctor who 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 yeah um but uh Especially a, a few different iterations of the doctor mm -hmm. always wears like fantastic footwear, mm -hmm. and I've always been like, oh, it'd be great to have some Doctor Who like, boots. I have a friend uh, in Canada who makes a lot of boots and shoes for movies, and uh, I can't remember. I can't remember which movie he worked for recently, but I, he probably has done some for Marvel. But anyway, he made a lot of the uh, fantastic, unusual footwear you see in films. Are made by this guy. You've made some boots for some pretty famous people. Not really. Um, I have made <laughs> strike. <laughs> I've, I've made God. boots. I've made boots for. Way back up. Good question. <laughs> I've made boots for Arnold Schwarzenegger, yeah. but as a rule, I have been called by many famous pe people, mm. and then they say, "Will you donate boots?" And I say, "No," and <laughs> that's where the conversation ends. There's there's just something that's amazing. Like, people that do like creative things. Just our magnets for folks who are like, hey, yeah. you need to do this like, amazing, wonderful thing that takes you know a bazillion hours. Can you just give it to us? Yeah. Well, here's the way I look at it. Insulting. It, yeah. Here's the way I look at it. <laughs> it takes me hours and hours and and years to get to this point to make a pair of boots. If you understand that, you won't ask me to give them to you. Absolutely. Me. Mm -hmm. And if you don't understand that, I don't want you advertising for me. Mm -hmm. So there, there's no win there. If you don't understand what I do, then why would I want you promoting me? Uh, I get it. I, I'm going to refrain because I'll go off on a tirade. <laughs> but I get what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, that, um, you're really uh, good at mowing your yard. Will you come do my yard? But no. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, there, there's uh, there's the, the cheapening of artistic skill yes. is... Uh, you know, and people are always, they're, they're trying to do good things. I mean, it's usually for like a, you know, charity or mm -hmm. different things. And so they're trying to do good stuff. But uh, yeah, people don't usually ask, you know, the catering company to like donate. Right. right. And that's money. another thing. I don't donate to auctions, no matter how wonderful the cause is. Um, mostly because I don't know who the end buyer is going to be. And there are people out there that have foot conditions I'm not qualified to deal with. So I don't want that person buying my product and then saying, yay, I won, now take care of me, and, and I can't. Mm -hmm. So I can't give up that sort of control. Uh, as I, you know, I, was, I was thinking, like, when you go to Walmart, do you, like, look at their boots and go, whatever? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't even look at the <laughs> shoe section at Walmart anymore. <laughs> well, like, like, when you go to, like, a concert or something, you see different people, you just kind of 
But oh, those oh, those are nice. Or I do. I'm yeah. very judgmental yeah. when it comes yeah. to yeah. shoes. Yeah. I admit. I would be too. I mean, it'll be so much fun to take you to like shows and like have your opinion on like like <laughs> Dwight Yoakam's boots. Like, what, what's what's what, what's Yoakam wearing? Is he, yeah. is he legit? <laughs> did he did he go to like a legit boot maker for his boots? Well, um, and I would really only be harsh if he's wearing something crappy and factory made because uh, okay. I'm friends with almost every boot maker and mm -hmm. and I admire their work. For instance, uh, we went on a cruise one time and I met Bill Anderson, and um, he had a pair of boots made by. A bootmaker in Texas, Lloyd Easterling, I think is his name. And um, I was like, they're wonderful. I love them because I don't poach and I admire other people's work. And and so, yeah, you're not going to hear me talking bad about other bootmakers, but factory stuff, I'll run that down all day long. So it's a tight community of bootmakers. Like if someone has made, like made a custom set of boots somewhere, you probably know who made them for them or often often okay. i do or i can recognize the maker yeah, and yeah cool. we're we're pretty tight again the community has changed so much even since i got into it because it used to be about protecting everything you knew and never ever sharing it and now uh we have youtube channels and we have facebook groups and we talk about what we know and what we wish we knew when we share because we've realized it's not about me anymore i'm going to mm. be gone someday now it's about the craft and yeah. if i don't pass it on it's going to die mm. and you don't have to make violins and i don't I wouldn't know how to do yeah. that <laughs> sorry so you gave chris the, like a perfect transition because he's been wanting to talk about his cruise well i can well, tell before we, oh. before yeah did you go on a cruise i went on my first cruise was but, it a country music cruise it was not. Oh, I, there's a Tracy Lawrence one I want to go on. But real quick, one last thing on the boots. Boot, <laughs> like jeans over the boot or jeans inside the boot? Whichever works, one works you're brave enough to do. I tell my customers that cowboy boots are a way for men to wear high heels and bright colors. Okay. And I also tell them that the art on cowboy boot tops is like lingerie. You know it's there and you feel pretty, but not everyone gets to see it. That's a lot of thoughts right there. Um, deep. <laughs> deep. Because if I like it took a year to have to build a boot and I see him walking around with it covered up, I'm like, dude. Well, some people <laughs> tuck that in. I made those. Some people Show do want to tuck their jeans in yeah. and just just put it out there, and others enjoy the feeling of going, "Hey, look what I've got." Exactly. Yeah, and that's what most people do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and living in Oklahoma, which is the hottest place on earth, Especially like all this week. yeah, all people wearing boots, and you can't see like their socks. I'm like, I can feel their boots sticking yes. to like their skin. I'm like, put some socks on or pull your socks up. It looks so uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. And there's nothing more attractive than cowboy boots and knee highs up to here. I would, I would, I would have socks up to here mm -hmm. and like, um, like the old school, like cowboy like things like hold your socks up. I would have to have I'm that. I'm not making him boots. No. <laughs> <laughs> Cause that's just the thought of like that, like, like sweaty leather touching like my skin like a cat yes. well you know uh -huh. i highly yeah. recommend yeah. leggings okay cool you, you oh, just leggings look right? uh -huh. yeah <laughs> he rocks them <laughs> right on word uh, yeah first cruise uh just got back nice and safe and, where did you go uh we drove down to galveston and then we went to well we we're supposed to go a few places but our our boat had a little uh, engine issue so a little, little yeah. issue <laughs> instead of 18 knots we we're only able to go nine knots most oh. of the time so it took us three days to get to costa maya mm -hmm. Costa Maya is so fun, though. It is. I, that's my favorite stop. Yes, that was uh, the very first stop. I've never done. Did you zip line? Did not zip line. Next time, zip where line. is Costa Maya? Maya. Where, where, what country is that? Uh, Mexico. Mexico. Okay. Just, <laughs> just south of uh, Cozumel. All right. On. And, and they have this huge zip line thing. Yes. The only bad thing I've is. I've seen it. I yeah, saw it. Yeah. Every one of them ends in the water. So there's no way to avoid getting wet. You're like holding yourself up, <laughs> levitating, and you still fall right into that pool. Ocean water is the worst. Yeah. Oh, it's so bad. It's just like, I'm like out there and then like someone will splash and it'll like get a little dab on my lip and I'm like done for, for <laughs> yeah. the rest of the day. It's oh, just it's so bad. Like instant gargling salt water. Oh, yeah. I went snorkeling for the first time. Oh, cool. And there was a little bit of a learning curve, and mm -hmm. that's where the salt water thing comes in. And I just learned. I, just bit hard on that thing and just trying to learn to breathe, but that was cool. Then we did the Cozumel and then and back to Galveston, but it was cool. a good time. It was a good time. Yeah. Huge ship. It was amazing what you can do. 15 stories high. They have an IMAX theater in there, swim pools. Most of the time you forget you're even on the ship. Mm -hmm. So it was cool. Yeah. Except for when you were losing power. So we lost power. Yeah. The videos are pretty entertaining. Twice. Yeah. Oh. And we had to make a stops. Uh, one of the cruise members had some type of a 
health issue and so we had to stop near Cosmel and they got the boat next to the big ship and sounds like your cruise was somewhat ill-fated yeah yeah <laughs> there, and then the lightning strike broke out a window uh seriously yeah yeah <laughs> remind <laughs> me to never cruise with him <laughs> yeah well i was we had a balcony because that's the way everyone says you got to do a balcony and i saw a storm on the horizon it's like oh cool storm ocean water i've never seen this before I'll do this and there's a big strike that looked like it hit the water i don't know i said oh i'm going in and as soon as I go in, there's another lightning, one of those lightning and thunder at the same time. It got a window wow. on the ship above. The, the last time I was on a cruise, we got to see a water spout. Just a teeny oh, wow. water spout. It was so cool. Because I've never gotten to see a tornado. I've always wanted to, but I haven't. Ooh. I, I intercepted a tornado once before coming back from vacation. Weber's Falls. Goals. Uh, nice. Yes. It was, I saw the... Um... I made the news in Tulsa. It was so good video, yeah. Well done, well done. Yeah, I got to see the 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 May third tornado. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, I was living on the south side of Oklahoma City with some buddies, and that day, um, one of the one of my roommates was watching the news, and we like a couple of us walked through, and we saw they were talking about like the impending doom mm -hmm. about the weather, and it wasn't as much as they do now, but mm -hmm. they still even back then, sure, they were, like, yeah. you know, Gary England was doing his thing, mm -hmm. and they mentioned something about how the, the storm was le was coming through Chickasha coming up through whatever that. and we were like they mentioned newcastle and we were like hey we're not too far from let's, let's hop in the van and go down and see if we can catch this Get tornado the so yeah. my, my buddy had like his old uh, dodge caravan like four or five of us hopped into his uh, van we drove down got to newcastle got up there and we were kind of just driving around just bored waiting for something to happen i don't see nothing yeah. we pulled up to like right next to like, i think it was the elementary school and it was right around like getting out of school time and they had they were like frantically getting all the kids off of the buses and like back into the building or getting them into the car the parents and we're like oh that's that seems this is exciting all of a sudden something's happening and so um we got back on the interstate going back north on 35 and we get up to one of those streets like like 119th or one of them it goes over i-35 and the whole thing is lined with uh, news vehicles yes and so we we did what we, that you're not supposed to do now, which was you park under the overpass, and we get out of my buddy's van. And we, you're the jerk. Yeah. <laughs> what do you know? Back then, it was like it was you know um, best practice to like hide under the overpass. Uh, and we, we you're the reason they made they made the rule out there, <laughs> Fortney. Yeah. They call it the Fortney yeah. rule. <laughs> Fortney clause. We, we climbed up to the top of the overpass, and as soon as we got up to the top of it, we turned around, and for a split second, and all of us tell this exact same story. Uh, for a second, we were like, like, this tornado is supposed to be here, but we don't see it. Where is it? That's not good. Then we realized that everything in front of us is the tornado. The wedge. Oh, yeah. Wow. Like, from, like, it was so close and so huge. It was, like, from over there to over there. At that point, we, like, screamed all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> and ran back and hopped into his van and, and just blazed like 90 miles an hour to like the next exit and found like somebody's basement to get into and it sounds like the fortney rule was yeah, a good yeah, idea you broke like 12 weather rules <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah. but this is olden times we yeah, didn't have, yeah, yeah. You know, mike morgan screaming at us to not do things yeah that's uh <laughs> boy that was, that's a big one too yeah it was mm -hmm. yeah uh, I so that one. You, you you the one video you posted you had the, the, your the captain had kind of gathered you guys into like the uh some big room it's on, the, on the boat cruise uh -huh. cruise talk again because uh, you were losing like electricity or something oh, yeah. what was that about yeah. lost power yeah uh, well we were in our room and we lost power the first time but it was only for 10 minutes it came back on yeah. and then we were actually in a comedy club and the power went out and it, it didn't go pitch dark in ours you can tell the backup generator mm -hmm. kicked in we never lost navigation, so that was a good thing. It's separate from the mm. like the cabin power, which is a good that's yeah. good ship making uh, skills there. But never lost navigation skill. But uh, we never lo went pitch dark in our little comedy club room. But in the dining room, it was pitch dark. Oh wow! It was like an hour long the uh, with no lights and no air conditioning too. Oh, the the yeah. person on the intercom giving you like the "Don't oh, be afraid" yeah. speech. Yes. You could tell that guy's voice was a little bit higher than usual. <laughs> yes. He was like, I'm a little afraid. And, uh, but don't be afraid. Hey, we you got don't full be afraid. navigation. We got full navigation. <laughs> this has never happened before. 
But it happens all the time, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Our cruise director, uh, been doing it for 12 years. He had never gone through one of those before. Yeah, I've, I've never experienced that, and I hope I don't. Yeah. Mm. And then one person else had to take off in an ambulance that caused Mel off the ship, too. Mm -hmm. But there's 3,500 people. I think I can see. Yeah, 3,500 people, cruisers, and then 1,400 staff. Yeah, and yeah. so, I mean, that's like a town of 5,000. Right. You know, an ambulance is going to run a time or two when you're yeah. in that, in that yeah. town. So. You're trapped in a, a big floating jar with every kind of like yeah. virus and we bacteria. We were on deck, and, too, and the, and the boats, the uh, Titanic safety boats, were on third floor. So I'm like... <laughs> 3,500, that's 4,900. I was counting them. <laughs> and there's like eight on this side. I'm sure there's eight on there. So I was like, there's room for us, yeah. You had the algorithm perfect, right? I, if I trip this many people on the way to the life, yeah, the that women and children. That, that's an old thing, like in '99. That, that's, well, that most of the people on their cruise are over the age of 75, so uh, your chances are good. Uh, yes, there was a lot of. You would never thought of there was like a lot of. Uh, yes. Walmart, uh, the. Yeah, carts, uh, motorized, motorized. Yes, carts. yeah. There's quite a few of those. More than I would ever thought of. Yeah, I think your chances are good. Yeah. Rascals. They used to call them like I don't think it was like a brand for a long time. It was popular. I think it was a rascal. Yeah, yeah. A motorized cart. It's yeah. amazing what you can do on there. I mean, you can different classes. Yeah, my cruise ship ballroom rule dancing you know. is if if I get to go on a cruise, I'm not allowed to use the elevator. So I oh, never really. go in an elevator when really. I'm on a cruise ship. My wife didn't use an elevator. Yeah. Well, when you're eating like 5,000 calories a day, that probably is a yeah. good rule of thumb. Yeah. They say you average one to two pounds a day while, while on the boat. <laughs> well, that's why I always take the stairs. I'm trying See, to mitigate that. I was on deck that. too, and all that stuff, most stuff was on 10. Mm -hmm. And so it was always a race. I, if I can get in the elevator up to 10 before my wife would mm. walk it. So yeah. it was about 50 50. So while you were gone, we had Red Brick Nights. The, yeah. The, the big July one. I, I saw uh, some drone video of the fireworks and another huge crowd. Yeah, somebody shot um, some drone footage from like the other side of the fireworks, mm -hmm. like, on like from, like the baseball field side. Yeah. That was kind of cool. I'd never seen that angle of the, the July fireworks show. That was fun. You know, I've got, um, that, I think that was the first one I ever missed, uh, the July one. And I remember, I think it was last year or two years ago, as I had my video camera, I was like, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get some pretty cool video of this, of the fireworks inside the stadium, uh, a different view because everyone sees it from there. I'm just trying mm -hmm. a different angle, uh, kind of like what uh, Sean did. Oh uh, yeah, with the drone. Sean Angle. And, yes, and so I'm in the stands, and I've been to some fires. I've been to some homicide. You know, I've been to some some weird stuff covering news. And I've seen some things. I've seen I've seen a few <laughs> things, but. Doing re recording that fireworks show was the first time I ever go. I think I'm too close <laughs> because it is loud. Things are fall on you. <laughs> it was like if one little malfunction just it looks like no big deal to somebody else, but I'm right there. And was, that was the first time I was like, I'm a little too close. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't near an F5 tornado or anything, mm -hmm. but uh, I like it. <laughs> well, like all that uh, afternoon uh, for the July whatever fireworks show six six yeah. Uh, there'd been a little bit of a breeze, but like, like as soon as the fireworks show started, like the breeze just disappeared, and so it was like, and like they were lighting up smoke. all this up, and just like the smoke was just kind of just sitting there and growing and sitting and growing, and for a few minutes I was like, I wonder if the smoke is just gonna kind of cover up all the fireworks, but it didn't. It, was it looked a like Jelzma was vaping. Right, <laughs> just a big, big cloud. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it was a fantastic fireworks show. Yeah, yeah. it was. It's always one of the big ones because I'm, I'm sure it's the same as last time, last time because it's like 20 minutes and it's like the biggest. It's like finale after finale and like yeah. like 20 minutes. How long was it this year? It was like about 30. Was it? Yeah, an hour. An hour? Yeah. My God. No, we, it, it feels <laughs> like it, was, it wasn't this one, but the one time before I was like, man, this is nonstop. Yeah. It kept going and kept going, we which is cool. Oh yeah. We had gone to to hang out in St. Louis the week before that, and so like on the Fourth of July, we went down to the Mississippi River and they had like their big fireworks extract. Like on the barge. Stuff. Yeah, they yeah. Put, pushed a big barge out there and blew a bunch of stuff up. Uh, but their like big St. Louis fireworks show was only like you know fifteen twenty minutes, and then yeah, it was like ours. Our little Guthrie fireworks show is super impressive. The um, yeah, uh, the Hoovers do a lovely job with that. They do. So congratulations yeah, to them. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks to them. Yeah. Bunch of people. Uh, tons and tons of people for that Red Brick Nights. Um, I'm sure there was 
plenty, plenty of folks that camped out in front of your shop here? Probably so. Yeah. I was in Arkansas that weekend. You run, you run away during those things? No, yeah. it's a, I just, we usually go to Arkansas that week. It's, and so I miss it. But such, I've heard that it's fantastic. Yeah, it's such a because people line up and down Division Street. Mm -hmm. They line up by the sheriff's office. They line up all throughout town. And I would not want to be, I don't want to be around if like that can't go on one year or something happens. It, people get used to stuff, mm -hmm. the custom oh, yeah. stuff. And you take that away, especially fireworks. Oh, they would riot. Oh, it would be, it, no. it would be a nightmare. Yeah, I, it can I, never stop. Now. I don't even think, even think about it yeah. was going away. My favorite person I saw, like in terms of like where they were watching the fireworks from, uh, I was I had to walk over to my truck over by Cash Saver at some point to get something, and somebody over at the tire shop over on Wentz had parked one of those like uh, giant like genie lift kind of things, mm -hmm. and so there were like three of them up there in the genie lift, just kind of hanging out in their chair, just watching the fireworks. That sounds fun. Yeah, mm. it's, but it's probably a little bit of a breeze up there too. Um, Next Red Brick Nights, August. Third. Third. Yeah. Two more this year, August 3rd, and then September, whatever the first Saturday is, September, September yeah. 7th or something. So, yeah. yeah cool. Another good year. So, Very good year. Um, uh, this weekend, no, the next, the following weekend, um, your neighbor, uh, Byron Berlin, his new shop is having a little grand opening kind of thing. So, they're going to have a concert that Saturday uh, and the act, the details of that Saturday, uh, the twenty seventh mm -hmm. at seven thirty, they have the first um, Byron Berlin band concert the inside the, the at the music hall. Yeah, at the cool. brand new um, double stop music hall. Got the logo painted on the side yep. of the building. Got the logo and the, and the sign on the front and stuff. So um, fifteen dollars at the door, uh, seven thirty on Saturday the twenty seventh, and they're also going to do um, another concert on that following day and a matinee if you will, at 2 o'clock on the 28th. So um, two shows to kind of kick things off on their new... He's location. got a ribbon cutting coming up soon with the with the chamber and yeah. all that good stuff. So yeah. Wednesday, well, chamber think... coffee kind of ribbon cutting thing, I think. Yep. Yeah. A lot of good stuff in the 200 block of East Oklahoma. Yep. That's right. Yeah. You, uh, you were a pioneer down here. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. When I moved here, you couldn't drag people to this end <laughs> yes. of the block with the chain, for real. Yeah. But now you've got like so your shops here. You've got the the, the boutique boutique mm -hmm. two hundred six across the street with clothing and stuff. You have your own Mexican restaurant like I two know. doors down. Was that nice of them just to like put a Mexican restaurant right just next for to me? You? Yeah. Yes, yeah, pretty cool. When the buildings caught fire, were you here? No, I was actually in England, okay. and I was at a, a dinner in England. So after the dinner was over, I was checking my phone, and I had multiple pe messages from people saying, "Are you okay? Are you okay?" And I'm like, "What happened? I'm yeah. in England." So no, I was not here. Any smoke? But, any smoky smell? No, I didn't. Good. It, Good. it was a week before I got back, but I didn't notice Good. anything. That yeah. smell can linger for a while. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and Lisa, thanks so much for letting this us hang cool. out here today. Well, thank you both. This I appreciate it. Super educational. Yep. And so, yeah, like, folks can go to like your YouTube page and kind of like see some different things. Yes, or... my my YouTube is Custom Boots. Cool. And my blog is WhatWouldLisaDo.net. And my Instagram is at Sorel Custom Boots. Cool. And so, yeah, check out all those things so you can kind of get a, a, an idea for all the, there's so much cool stuff in here. Uh, I just like, I want like. Uh, Don't touch it. I know yeah, you want right. to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's so many of these machines. I know we were like, I already did like the thanks for having us here thing, which is kind of like the usually like we're, we're ending. Right. But now I'm looking at all the machines and I'm like, these all look like irreplaceable things. Aisle four Walmart. You can get there. <laughs> right. You can come back another time and I'll, I'll give you a tour. Okay, cool. Cool. All right. Well, yeah, thanks. Thank you. All right. We'll see you guys uh, next week. Coming home, coming home, coming home.